months ago, I got an offer from a former colleague to provide a psychoeducational lecture with the bank on the psychology of money. And when she gave me that offer, I realized that I honestly didn't know anything about the psychology of money. I didn't even know where to start. And so if you know me, you know that I went down a rabbit hole and I read a lot of books to try to educate myself on this topic, not only on the psychology of money, but also on the actual finance aspect because I felt like I had a lot of gaps in my knowledge there as well. Now, after months of looking into this, I can finally confidently talk to you about the psychology of money. If you wanna actually hear me rate and recommend all the different money books that I read in this period, I will have a video about that very soon on my Book and Hearth channel, so make sure you're following me on there. Now, the psychology of money is obviously a very broad topic, so let me explain exactly what we're gonna be talking about in this video. It basically boils down to how our mindsets about money can either set us up for success or for failure. So I'm gonna talk about where our money mindsets come from, the money mindsets that limit our financial success, and those that do the opposite, essentially the mindset that can actually maximize your chances at attaining financial security and freedom. Now look, things like luck and circumstance and risk obviously play a big role in how things turn out. But I actually can't change your luck. I can't change your circumstances. Even if 90% or 91% of it is circumstance or luck, if there is even 1% or 10% where mindset comes in, that is what I'd like to help you with in this video. Part one, where money mindsets come from. So the first thing you got to understand, and this is actually something that I learned from the book, The Psychology of Money, which was actually not that much about the psychology of money, in my opinion. But I think the author did a good job of talking about how our beliefs about money are essentially a reflection of our experiences and the messaging that's been provided to us by family members, other role models, other things we've seen around us. You will often hear people talk about the way that the world works, the way that money works, but the universe is a very very, very heterogeneous place where there is bound to be a ton of variation in terms of the experiences that people have out there. And so our beliefs about money are almost always just a reflection of our experiences, not necessarily reality. Let me give you an example. Someone with a great deal of privilege who has a lot of financial freedom, was maybe born into it, they're going to be incentivized to believe that a lot of where they are today is due to just pure hard work, effort, not really related to luck at all because that would challenge their experiences versus someone who grew up watching their parents really struggle to put food on the table, working really hard for it, is probably going to grow up believing that the world is not a fair or equitable place, that hard work does not correlate to actual abundance. My intention in this video is not to get at the truth. My intention isn't to help you see things more realistically because I don't think that's possible. I think all of these anecdotes and all of these experiences are valid in their own specific set of circumstances. My intention is to help you get at the money mindset that is scientifically shown to help you the most, to help you actually achieve your financial goals. Also, Another thing you got to understand is that money mindset issues are often a reflection of values issues. Let me give you an example. A person that very often splurges on very luxurious items, on things that are supposed to, uh, you know, evoke a certain status in their social group. Choosing to splurge on those things and then doesn't have money left over for their kid's education, for instance. That tells me that that person values social validation and status more than they value their children's well-being and long-term security. Or here's another example. One time I was at a dinner and somebody forgot to bring enough money to pay for their meal. They let their friends cover for them didn't even say thank you, and then went on to talk about an expensive video game that they bought yesterday. It comes down to values. That person wanted the video games. You know, that's what they wanted to spend money on, and they didn't want to spend money on the meal that they'd had for themselves. So often what we are willing or not willing to pay for comes down to what we actually want. If there's something that we feel like we 
don't want very much, then we don't feel like it's worth paying for it. For instance, I'm blessed to live in a beautiful home, but it is not worth how much I'm spending on it for rent. I live in an extremely, extremely expensive city, one of the most expensive in America, if not the world. So resentment is bound to build up about that because if you don't think that something is worth the value that you're paying for, then you're not going to want to pay for that thing. We only want to pay for things that we actually value. So what are the money mindsets that lower your chances at abundance. I think the biggest thing that I see these days is people who just don't believe they can attain their financial goals. And that is an extremely dangerous thing because self-efficacy, our ability to believe that we can set out to do the things that we want to do is extremely important for actually accomplishing those things. Study after study after study talks about how a high self-efficacy sets people up for success in a lot of different arenas of their life. If you don't believe that you can do it, either because you don't believe in your own capabilities or because you have a very pessimistic view of the world as a very unfair, negative place, that's really going to lower your chances of actually meeting your financial goals. If you don't have hope that your circumstances can get better, that's also a risk factor to not actually accomplishing the things that you want to accomplish for yourself. I would say the mindset that characterizes people who tend to achieve their goals the most is somebody who has a deep desire, who's very in touch with what it is that they want and why they want it, who has deep faith in their ability to accomplish that thing. I'm talking about faith in themselves, faith in the world as a place that can get better, faith in the future as a place that's filled with hope, and they follow through with action, and of course, luck helps a lot, and in the end, they get what they want. In this formula, the piece that is missing is the faith, not having faith in yourself, in the world, in the future, etc. Now look, you might have very good reasons for not having faith in those things. You might have had experiences that taught you the world is not a good and safe and positive place. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that that's not the case because I don't know your circumstances. It very well could be, given your circumstances. But if you want to ultimately break out of your circumstances, Breaking down those beliefs can be a great first step. Now, another reason why you might be limiting your chances at financial freedom is that you don't have that desire piece. You're not in touch with what it is that you want and why you want it. A lot of people, especially people who struggle with depression, for instance, don't have that deep drive for things. They have what's called anhedonia, no longer enjoying or wanting things that they used to want and enjoy. And that can be very difficult to treat because something that helps people get better is that fire, that spark for wanting things to get better. If you don't want things to get better in the first place, it's very challenging to break out of it. On a smaller scale, this can just look like someone that maybe doesn't have a ton of ambition. You know, they have the job that they want, they're okay with it, they're okay with the pay, they're okay with where they are in life, and that's not a negative thing necessarily. You know, you could be perfectly satisfied with your life circumstances, and I think that's great actually. But not having that sort of spark for wanting something more or wanting things to be better is probably not going to make you more money. Guilt is another thing that's holding a lot of people back. I think we live in an age where there's so much messaging around if you have money, you should feel guilty about it. You have privilege, money is the root of all evil, you know, expressions such as that. So if you are internalizing those messages, why would you ever actually want to be wealthy? You know, if you think that wealthy people are evil, of course you're going to unconsciously do anything in your power to make sure that you're not like those evil people that you speak of. For instance, I once heard somebody who, you know, I, I know their circumstances, they're pretty well off. They would say things like, oh, I'm not rich, I just have, you know, high socioeconomic status. And in my mind, I was like, what, what do you mean by that? Like, they're kind of synonymous. You know, there's just so much guilt about even saying, I'm a wealthy person or I come from good means because a lot of people have internalized this message that that makes you a bad person. That means you have something to repent for. That means that you haven't earned it or you're taking it from someone else. In the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki, he talks about how he had one poor dad growing up and one rich dad growing up. And the rich dad, even when he wasn't rich yet, he would always say, how am I going to 
to be able to afford this. Whereas the poor dad would always say, I'm never going to be rich or I can't afford this. The way that you speak about yourself has a huge impact on your outcomes. If you put yourself in the box of someone that has a lack, you're unconsciously going to fulfill that prophecy. Another example is I saw this reel at some point in the past few weeks and it was about a woman just taking us through her day in New York and it was nothing crazy. She got maybe like coffee and breakfast. That's what she was showing the camera guy. And so many of the comments were saying, oh, look at this rich little girl. I bet she's living on daddy's money. Look at her nails. You can just tell. There's just such a rampant belief particularly I feel like among liberal American youth that money is evil and if you have it you should feel guilty about yourself. To make so many assumptions about someone which like you don't know, you don't know what our life circumstances are. I make my own nails at home, I don't pay a cent for them, like you don't know what somebody is going through. But let's say that she was rich, you know, why is that something to hate her for? I don't understand people that like dunk on Nepo babies or like trust fund kids because all that basically means is that their parents had means that they're then using to bring up their children. To me, that is the most noble use of a person's money is to provide security and stability and freedom to your kids. Way more noble than anything you could possibly spend on. You know, I even have family members now who just had babies and they don't come from wealth, but they're making a very active effort to make sure that their children at the age of 25 or 30 have enough for a house. That to me is so inspirational. You should want to give your kids as many opportunities as possible if you can. Now there's a case to be made that uh, certain Nepo babies or trust fund kids are sort of given everything with a silver spoon and behave entitled and don't understand how lucky they are and pretend that other people don't have what they have just because they're not working hard enough. Fair enough, I get that. But I don't think we should assume that's people just based on like the type of nails that they have or the way that they look, you know, making assumptions about people's character when we don't actually know anything about their finances and nothing about their character suggesting that. If you want to know my theory on whether money makes people evil or whether money is the root of all evil, and again, this is probably based on my own experiences in life, I don't think it's money that makes people evil. I think that there are people of all different kinds, some that are willing to harm others and some that aren't. And when the people that are willing to harm others get a lot of money and power, then they use it to harm them. Some of the people that don't have money would do that if they were given the opportunity. Just like some of the people that don't have money that have good hearts wouldn't do that if they had that money. And just like some of the people that are rich don't hurt anyone. I really don't think that it's about the money. I think it's about a person's character. Think about for you, for instance. I imagine if you clicked on this video, maybe you have some interest in gaining more wealth. Do you have sinister reasons? Are you sitting here thinking like, hmm, how am I going to hurt people today? Or is it more like, I want to not worry if I can pay my bills this month. I want to provide a safe environment for my children to grow up in. I want my kids to be able to afford things. I want to occasionally be able to travel to beautiful places. Like none of these are sinister reasons. I honestly feel like it's a very small minority of people who have power and abuse it that affect a ton of people negatively. Low self-esteem is something else that could be holding you back. What I mean by this is you basically just don't believe in your worth. You don't believe that you have value. You don't believe that you deserve to be compensated for the things that you do, at least not to the extent that you actually do. For example, as part of a lot of healthcare fields, clinical psychology included, you are expected to work for free for many, many years. I saw clients for three years unpaid while I was in school, and then another year where you basically get paid close to nothing. Luckily, I was at an internship site that really pushed for their interns to get a pay rise, which I was very appreciative of, but the vast majority of internships pay their interns close to nothing. What effect do you think that has on a person's psyche? I know that for me, when I got out of grad school and I opened my own business and I started to monetize my services, I felt a lot of guilt about that. I felt like, well, am I really worth it? I should be providing this for free. When you have low self-esteem like that, you're expected to put everyone else's needs above your own. And then you might end up in a situation like not being able to support your family or put food on the table because you considered somebody else needs this money more than me. Fear is another one of those things that can hold you back financially. If you're terrified of failure or you're terrified about a catastrophic outcome happening, that's going to inhibit you from gaining as much of the financial success that you want. 
failure is inevitable and something that I've learned a lot, not only in all these money books that I've read, but also in all of the mindset books that I've read is that the people that are most successful fail the most and they get right back up on the saddle and they learn from it instead of thinking that that means game over for them. So failure is really not something that we should worry about. It's a, it's an opportunity to grow. It's a chance to do better, to learn from something, to become more powerful. If we live in fear of failure or in fear of terrible things happening to us, then we're not going to get very far. It only takes one big win to make up for all of the failures. Something else that might very ironically be holding you back from receiving more is miserliness. Miserliness, what I mean by is basically you are completely focused on give, give, give to me and you never give back to others. You just take. I've met people like this at every socioeconomic status. I don't think that it's related to how much you have. It's related to not wanting to give to anyone but yourself. In the book, The Seven Spiritual Laws of Success, the author talks about how abundance is a flow between give and take. And I completely agree with that. If you only ever focus on what you can receive, you're not going to receive at one point because there's no flow that way. Think about even like out in nature, what goes up must come down. Spring comes around and then eventually fall comes around and those plants have to decay and to die in order to be reborn. In order to have any sort of growth, you also need to have its polar opposite of shedding. And scarcity mindsets not only hurt the people that you're not giving to who are depending on you or could really use your help in some way, they're also robbing you of abundance that you could have. And I am not just talking about money here. When I'm specifically talking about miserliness, I am not just talking finances. I'm talking energetic things that you give to people, even like goodwill. I'm talking about giving emotional support. I'm talking about investing time and effort into your friendships. Things that you don't need to have a lot of material, physical things to give these things back to others. So let me give you some examples of how this works, how ironically not giving back robs you of more abundance. The first example is that people distance themselves from mooches. And I've personally been in this position before where I really felt like someone was taking advantage of my friendship and the things that I was providing to them. And at some point, people pull back. You know, I've heard people describing their friends as like my really rich friend who gives me expensive presents. When I heard that, I was like, are you serious? This, this is a friend that you're talking about. Another example is that if you don't spend on business expenses, you're going to probably end up spending more. So let me explain. When you have a business, certain things that are for your business, you can use as a tax write-off. For instance, if you have um, a microphone, for instance, if you use a microphone for your business, you can write that off of taxes. You have to initially spend the money to invest in a better microphone though. So on the surface, it might seem like, oh, well, I'm giving, I'm not receiving in this way. But you are actually receiving because if you have a quality microphone, more people are going to watch your videos and you're not actually going to have to pay more because that's going to be deducted from your taxes. So it's kind of like, would you rather invest in your business and then have your business do better? Or would you rather spend the same amount of money on taxes? Giving a little in one area is going to give you back more. Another example when I was first starting out with opening my clinical practice, I wanted to get more referrals from people in the community, other therapists. And when initially I would just go to people and say, hey, could you add me to your referral list? Not a lot of people were responsive to that. When I shifted gear from how can I get on people's referral list to let me build up my referral list, that ironically got me on more people's referral lists because I would reach out to people and say, hey, it looks like you deal with this and that. Can you tell me a little bit about your practice so that I can add you to my spreadsheet? And I had a spreadsheet that I could give to clients or prospective clients who needed a different kind of support than what I could provide for them. But so many of those people, when I reached out to them and asked them about their practice and basically scratched their back, wanted to scratch mine in return and said, oh, tell me about you. I can add you to my referral list. And here's the last example that I'll give of how miserliness ironically robs you of more abundance is if you have like business partners, if they pay you a specific amount of money and then it turns out that you're not actually providing them that much value or you're not doing a good enough job, you're not delivering what it is that they're paying for, 
they're not going to want to work with you in the future. So you're actually losing money by trying to short people. Now, sometimes people have the opposite problem where they overextend themselves for someone else's benefit at the expense of their own benefit. For example, a lot of people are unfortunately stuck in situations where they're working for a company or a job or a boss that really could not give a shit about them. You know, they're hemorrhaging loyalty to either a corporation or a person that does not give loyalty back. I came across something similar years ago when I had group projects in grad school, and there was one person in particular that always wanted to work with me on group projects and would not put in the work. And by working with them, by partnering up with them, it would actually double the amount of work that I had to do. So you can absolutely limit your financial or, or professional or academic success by overextending yourself for people who do not give in return. Because in that case, the energy is all going out from you and never coming back to you. So you have to put yourself in situations where you have that flow of both give and take. And the last way that a ton of people set themselves up for failure financially in terms of their mindset is an external locus of control. I've actually made entire videos on this, on how believing that your life outcomes are due to factors outside of your control has very damaging effects on your life. I feel like this goes hand in hand with entitlement. Because if you feel like other people are responsible for the things that happen to you, either the good or the bad, then you're going to feel entitled to freebies from people. You're essentially saying, you are responsible for the things that I want. You need to give me the things that I want. I can't control it. I can't have any effect on whether I get the things I want. You have to be the one to give it to me. And let me be very clear, I am not talking about people that can't make ends meet and need freebies like food stamps or uh, government services, not at all. I'm talking here about people that are entitled in the sense that they don't put in any effort to make their life circumstances better and they expect other people to do it for them. This happens in a ton of different settings, not just the financial. It happens like when people say, oh, do my homework for me because I for some reason can't be bothered to do it myself or buy me this dinner that I can afford to pay for just because I don't feel like paying for it. Let me tell you a secret. Nothing in life is free. If something sounds like it's free, sounds like it's too good to be true, there are strings attached. People that say, oh, check out my free PDF or sign up for this free resource that I have, they're probably trying to get you to sign up for their newsletter or to be in the loop for monetizable services that they have. And that's not bad, you know? I'm not saying that that's evil or manipulative of them, but you need to be aware that nothing in life is free. Or actually, I shouldn't say nothing. Some things, you know, are purely altruistic and generous and uh, pro-social and based on empathy but they're very far and few. Most things in life aren't free. I also think there are certain things that keep people from maintaining wealth. So all of what I've been talking about so far, mindset issues that keep people from accumulating wealth, but once you actually have wealth, there are a few other factors that might actually make you lose wealth. One of them is a need for validation. I've kind of alluded to this in the introduction, but if you really want people to know that you're a certain status or to admire you or to validate you in some way, you're probably going to want to signal your wealth in a way that actually reduces your wealth. I think it was in The Psychology of Money where he was talking about how wealth is what you don't see about people. You can see if someone's rich, you can see what kind of car they're driving, you can see if they're wearing expensive jewelry or uh, live in an expensive house, but there could be broke people that have those things that are in debt because of it, that don't have any savings because of it, or there can be very wealthy people that you may never know. They're wearing something very inconspicuous. Personally, some of the wealthiest people that I've ever met, you would never know how incredibly wealthy they are. That money is meant to buffer them from the stresses of the world. That money is there as a security net, so they're not gonna spend it on stuff that's gonna depreciate over time. And there was one really good section in the psychology of money where he said, when you have something flashy or expensive or nice, People aren't admiring you for having that thing. 
they're imagining themselves being admired for having that thing. They're saying, oh, when I have a purse like that, everyone's going to think that I'm so fancy. And I thought that was so true. You know, like we have this assumption that like, oh, when I get this pretty dress, people are going to think I look so cute in it. People are probably going to want to look cute in that dress themselves. They're not thinking about you. They're thinking about themselves. And so when you're in this race of like, let me show off my riches. Let me show off how much I have so that people will admire me. It's a losing game. People aren't going to admire you. They're going to want those things for themselves. Greed is something else that makes people lose a lot of money. There are countless examples throughout history of people that got too close to the sun, thought that they needed more and more and more until eventually they did something illegal or they hurt somebody, they hurt the wrong person or they lost all their wealth in some sort of huge risk. You need to know when enough is enough. And past a certain point, more money doesn't equal more happiness. More money equals different kinds of problems. Actually, let me know if you want me to make a video on the research behind this, on whether money actually makes people happy. And lastly, the last thing that limits people from preserving their wealth once they have it is a sense of invincibility and a lack of humility. So many people, once they get a little taste for something, especially if it's new, they think, oh, this is my new normal now. This is my baseline. This is what I'm going to have forever. You learn very quickly in the YouTube game, that's not always the case. You know, sometimes views fluctuate, analytics fluctuate, it goes up and it goes down. Don't ever think that you're invincible. Don't ever think that your peak is actually your baseline. Let me give you a concrete example of this. So when you start making more money, it's very difficult for people to resist the temptation to not spend it, to not upgrade their lifestyle. Let's say uh, beforehand you had 3,000 in your checking account every month, and then you get a little bonus, and now you have 5,000 every month. It's very easy for your mind to switch into oh, this is what I have now to spend. It's almost impossible to resist the impulse to spend when you have something new and shiny. But living below your means is the only way to actually accumulate wealth. Because if you're making more and more money, but your lifestyle is also going up, you're not actually making more money. In the end, it kind of evens out. The only way to actually accumulate wealth is to increase how much you're making while decreasing how much you're spending. Or one of the two, but preferably both. Remember that wealth is money not spent. That's riches. Riches and wealth are different. So something that I do personally to make sure that I don't upgrade my lifestyle if, if I have a good month is as soon as I get paid, I instantly transfer into my taxes account, into my savings account, into my retirement investing account immediately so that that money is out of sight, out of mind. I don't think about it. I don't think about spending it. It's not like I'm going to take it out of those savings accounts. No. So those are all the different issues that come up with money mindset that limit people's ability to accumulate or preserve their wealth. Let's put it all together and talk about the mindset of somebody that is most likely to have financial abundance. Somebody in that position is likely going to be very, very aligned with why they want the money that they want. They understand what that money represents to them. Let me give you an example. Some people want to see $10,000 in their bank account because they want to feel like they did something really hard. Other people want to flex on others. Other people want to save up for a house so that they don't have to pay on rent every month. Other people want to go get nice food and travel and buy pretty things. There are limitless amounts of reasons why somebody could want more money. A person that is going to be set up for success is very, very clear on what those reasons are, on why they want the money, what they want it for, how they're going to use it, and they keep that at the forefront of their mind every single day. When they go to work, when they're deciding what to spend on, they keep that at the forefront. Oh, I'm not going to spend an extra $30 on this thing because I want to save up for a house. I'm going to stay late today and work an extra hour for my business so that my kids can go to a nice college. If you want that mindset of a winner, you got to get really, really clear on what it is that you want and why you want it and keep that at the forefront. Number two is somebody who believes they can do it. I have a couple of videos already on ways to increase your sense of internal locus of control and your confidence and your self-efficacy. So check those out if you feel like you need a little bit of work with that. But just understand that if you are very rigidly attached to this belief that you can't do it, 
you can't get out of your circumstances, things are fixed like this, it's going to be very, very challenging to break out of it. Number three, they take responsibility for their life. They follow up with action. They don't just do all the things I just mentioned. They also implement the actions that they need to take in day-to-day -day life in order to make their dreams come true. They're proactive, they make lists, they make sure they go after what they want in the short term so that they can achieve their long-term goals. They also know their worth and value and they won't be convinced otherwise. They're realistic. They say, you know, if the service I provide is worth $130, that is the value of what I provide. I'm not going to be shamed or guilted into people who don't think that it's worth that value. You know, one of my former colleagues was talking about how Sometimes clients will want to use your services and then not want to pay for those services. I remember saying to her like, you know, that's so interesting because that client clearly thinks you are valuable enough to continue seeing. If she didn't think you were valuable, she would just stop seeing you, but she sees your value and she just doesn't want to pay for it. So know your worth and don't let other people sway you on that. Person set up for success also has no fear of failure and they have a growth mindset. They understand that when I fall 99 times, that is only so that the hundredth time I get up is the one that is successful. They understand what they can take from bad experiences, from mistakes they've made, and they take that moving forward. They are also generous with others and remember this does not only mean financially if you don't have the means to be generous with other people financially i'm willing to bet there's something else you can give to them that's not material even if it is just goodwill or gratitude or a kind word there are so many things that you can give to others if you can get in the habit of giving to others what it is that you want to receive that's going to set you up for success can't what do you think is the secret to abundance I agree. The person that's going to be set up for success is also going to set boundaries with people who are trying to take advantage. They're going to see leeches for what they are and say, nope, not having it. I'm a generous person and I'm not going to be around someone that just wants to take, take, take. They also don't care about validation. They focus on freedom, security, and whatever other values they have. They're not going to focus on what do people think about me? Are they admiring what I have? That's going to lose your wealth. That's going to make sure that your wealth, if you do have it, tanks. They also understand that more money isn't always better and they know when to stop. They understand to be grateful for what they do have. They understand when their ambitions are getting a little bit out of control and they can be happy with just the simple things in life. They don't need to have more and more and more and more. Lastly, they understand that they are not invincible. They consider that things could change. Things could ebb and flow. At some point, the unexpected might pop up. Stay humble. Keep delivering quality services in whatever industry you're in. You know, keep doing a good job at whatever it is that is giving you money. Because if that stops, if you think, oh, it's just going to continue to come and I don't have to do anything for it, at some point, people are going to stop giving you anything at all. This video was a lot longer than I expected. Do let me know what you thought about it. And if you want to hear me rate the different money books that I've read over the past few months, don't forget to check out my second channel, Book and Hearth, and click the bell notification so that you can be notified when I post on there. Take care.